Hello, my name is Polly McSorley and I'm a freelance visual artist. I'm originally from Newton Stewart in County Tyrone, but I've been living here in Ackle for almost 10 years now. I actually thought it would be a really lovely idea to, to take a dander down to the shore earlier um, to record this contribution of mine for the, the series of Splendid Isolation, just given the really fine weather that we've had um, of late, most especially for this time of year. And, um, with consideration of the prevailing travel restrictions, which are um, are still in place, obviously, um, I thought it would be a nice opportunity to share a slice of the island in all its beauty and wonder um, with you all, and to allow you the opportunity to to step a foot onto the beach at Kiel with me, which would have been really nice. Um, but my plan didn't really go to plan. I spent about 10 minutes uh, yarning into the camera down there only to realise that the most audible thing on the recording was the sea breeze blowing across the strand. Anyway, I've come back up the hill home and I, I've decided that I won't let that wee adventure be a tip of the hat to the concept that perhaps visual artists should be seen and not heard. But um, instead I will consider it a really lovely opportunity actually to welcome you all into my home and my studio. This is both the, the space that I, I live in and create from and it's an especially nice treat to have you all with me, as virtual as it may be, um, because for the past 10, 11, Maybe 12 weeks, I don't know, I've, I've kind of lost count at this stage, um, but it's, it's literally just been me here. Um, actually, aside from the, the very odd village from the postman, God bless him. <laughs> anyway, Shanae, and uh, welcome to my world. I'd say for most people who know me watching this, they're in absolute awe of how the Linden Hall has managed to get me here and agree to do it. Um, <laughs> I, I think some people in the world of art love being front and centre and maybe some people also call themselves emerging artists at another stage of the game but I am neither of those, to be honest, I'm like the opposite of those I, I'm probably what you might call a submerged artist, like I, I like staying in the depths um, I love working away quietly, um, just tipping away at my own wee thing and I have really specific ideas about how I create art and how I share it and how I show it and how I sell it and um, that almost keeps me below the radar um, constantly and um, I think that will make sense as my interview goes on but um, the point that I'm trying to make is that the Linen Hall have been serving us so well over this pandemic period, um, like on a Wednesday I'm dancing, on a Thursday I'm drumming and then there's my own music and poetry and so much more um, and all these things are helping to preserve our spirit and stay connected and to just find some strand of happiness in, um, in the confusion and the uncertainty that we're amidst but like you can't keep drawing from something and drawing from it and um, and say that you're thankful for that and um, when given an opportunity to contribute towards that then say no, like that doesn't make any sense so it doesn't matter how scared I am of cameras or how poor this interview might even end up the fact that I've agreed to do it is a huge testament to the respect I have um, for the work that is, that is ongoing and um, just once again thank you for all of that I'm actually not too sure how interesting my story or my journey in art and through art really is um, because when you're living something yourself that's what becomes normal to you um, and you wonder why it might be of interest to anyone else at all um, and I, I suppose the roots of, of my journey in art begins just really simply at home as a child um, we're an ordinary working class family, but um, if art could be considered like um, use of, of the imagination or ingenuity or, I don't know, creativity and expression, then, then my childhood was all of that because of my parents. Um, 
and I'm so, so grateful for that. Um, and I suppose everything was, um, was pulled together by a real sense of playfulness. Um, so art, fundamentally to me, is, um, is a form of play. Um, and that's actually a really important point um, th and something that I've carried with me in my work and, and through my work and, uh, and also as a person. Um, I think life can be serious enough at times um, and to have a, a sense of playfulness at your core is like, um, it's like making a sandwich, you know, that's, that's your foundation for it and if you can fit all these other things in between like um, sense of adventure or um, consciousness or consideration or profundity, maybe a wee bit of seriousness as well and compassion and then take another slice of this playfulness and, and put it on top and and make that be what you want people to taste when they see your work then um, yeah home really provided the means for me to do that because of the way I, I grew up uh, at home and like mum and dad really encouraged us to question things and to um, explore things and to to be able to form our own own opinions uh, and thoughts about the world around us, but be able to do that in a respectful manner, and um, that was also a really strong part of my upbringing, which I'm glad for. Um, but I, uh, why I chose art was because you, you could take this one subject, art and design, and you could approach it from any angle that you wanted. So I loved Irish language and I loved sport and I loved geography and everything to do with nature and um, I loved the thought of travel and I loved politics. I was informed by politics growing up in a really small segregated town and um, uh, I, all these things could be brought together and I could go any direction that I wanted with them and Art, art could be everything and um, I wanted to delve into that and explore that and have the crack with that. Um, I was advised by a few of my tutors um, to apply for graphic design so I did so in Belfast and then I applied to the equivalent of that which would have been the Bachelor of Design in Visual Communication at NCAD in Dublin and I was the only student from the north who was awarded a place on the course at NCAD and this seemed to delight everybody around me, but um, to be honest, I didn't know a way lot about what the course was about. And um, I, I actually just loved drawing and um, adventuring my way through things. And it was nearly part of the pull towards the course that I, I didn't know exactly what it was about. This kind of intrigue has followed me for my whole life. Like, um, it, the mystique and the mystery of it all um, seemed to draw me towards it and I, I didn't even want to know anymore because I, I trusted the people around me who were saying that it really suited me perfectly and uh, so the combination of mystery and faith <laughs> were big deals to me and uh, they probably still are and that's what led me all the way to Dublin. I loved Alice, Alice Myers, um, um, statement and her contribution to the series whenever she said when she finished art college that she hit the ground running and I found a real resonance with that because that's exactly what I did but just not in the way that people expected me to. <laughs> By the time I left art college I literally hit the ground running as far away from art uh, and that world as I could manage. Um, I just needed to, to find a way to release all this energy that was inside me and more than that art um, became something that I was so conscious of um, at that stage like everybody in my class knew what direction they wanted to go in with their work they all knew um, I don't know what their preferences in that world were they were extremely confident in themselves and I was like Words away from that, I felt um, even less confident um, because, do you know what, uh, for the first time in my life I realised um, the power of art. Actually, that's the truth. Um, 
up until then it had, it had been play, but um, for the first time in my life then I um, I realised that art could be this um, really massive tool um, that could let you connect with people, that could be a form of propaganda, that could be a form of marketing, that was communication, that could inspire people, that could help people, that could um, help you uh, relay your frustrations or your sense of injustice about the world and um, whenever I considered that I also considered it a huge responsibility to use it wisely and um, I didn't feel like I was ready to make those kind of decisions um, because as I say I felt I needed to know so much more about the world and um, and that's why I decided to take a break from, from everything, from drawing, from painting, from uh, just any thoughts on, on the world of art. And I, it looked like I had just turned my back on it. And um, I really challenged other people's perceptions of me at that time. And it's, um, it's one of the most important things I've ever done, to be honest. Um, actually, I find it a wee bit emotional talking about it. <clears throat> it's um, it's not easy to to stand firm to what you really believe and to have the courage to to do what you think is right all the time. And that's all that I was trying to do then. I was trying to respect what I loved so much, and I was trying to to go back to source and remember what I loved so much about growing up, the values that I held. Um, through nature, through play, um, through adventure, through storytelling, um, through the faith that my parents shared, um, all these things combined um, and I decided that I wanted them to be a part of my life so much in alignment with art that I needed the time and space to figure out how I would do that in the best I way. I suppose before this um, I was with Ackle Outdoor Education Centre and um, that was my role by day and that was very much um, at, at the discretion of the weather to be honest. Um, I could be up a hill or, or on the mountain or I could be in the sea surfing or surf kayaking or I could be paddling down a river um, as conditions might see fit and so whenever I got home from that role I would step into to the realm of, of my process of creation then and I suppose that's the, the pattern that, that I've, my life has followed for the past six or seven years now to be honest. Um, I, I am one thing by day and that has been largely associated with um, either learning or work in, in the outdoors and the field of outdoor education. Um, and yeah, I'm, I suppose I'm like your, your regular Marvel hero or villain leading a, a double life of sorts. Um, once I, I leave that realm, I'm, I'm thrown into um, the self-discipline and the self-motivation and um, the self-mastery of anything that I might create. Um, and that's a, a really difficult balance to uphold at times because you're almost putting in, or probably putting in more hours to your art than you are to your daytime role and um, I don't know I might start painting or creating at seven just after dinner in the shower in the evening and that could be me right through until two or three in the morning depending on, on the gusto I feel for the project that I'm working on or the time restraints or deadlines that I'm faced with um, or the enthusiasm that I have around the topic as well um, but by and large uh, there's nobody to get me up in the morning, there is nobody hanging over my shoulder um, telling me to sit down at the desk or to stand at the easel when the one thing that your body is telling you that you want to do is to sit by the fire after a day in the water and it's freezing in the winter and um, or you just want to watch a film or read a nice book and, and go to bed early for the next day again but um, like we all have limitations and there's only 24 hours in a day and unless I I physically make myself um, uh, create that space for my work. It, like the art that I dream of just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so that that's quite challenging at times, and um, I get on with that in 
in a quiet way, I suppose, so I, I don't make a big deal of it. It's something that I have chosen to do and um, yeah, it's just my own personal journey, I suppose. But there are times when you have to pull yourself out from the excitement and the crack of life that you also love being a part of um, in order to make that work. And um, sometimes I find that challenging as well, but at the end of the day, once you have brought to life something that never existed before um, through your art and you can feel a sense of purpose um, within that then that's a, an incredibly re-energising feeling and um, and also the relationship that, that is shared between my world in the outdoors and my world in the evenings creating art is really mutually beneficial. One almost drives the other for me and um, yeah, it's, there's a great um, sense of symbiosis, I suppose you, you might call it, and um, it's something that works for me. Not everybody would find that, um, the, the idea for, to create an art, but it's something that really works for me, almost balancing the body and the mind, and, um, and not separating them, um, working with them as a whole. In terms of the commissions I'm working on, they could be anything, and um, my, my style varies quite a lot in terms of the work I produce based on what the subject matter is that I, I am relating to and also the, the mediums that I choose to use. Um, so how I would describe my art is probably empathic. Um, like there's deep consideration and, and care for what I'm either being asked to do or, or that which I choose to pour my energy into and I think that's the most important part of, of the work for me is that that it is something meaningful and something that I think contributes not only to to my, my development as an artist and as a person as I as I sit with that subject, but um, I don't know. You'd like to feel that you're contributing to the wider world in, in some context um, by by the expression of these feelings um, in an articulate manner. I guess my initial reaction to um, COVID-19 and the restrictions it would place on life and how it would affect my art were, were initially feelings of relief, uh, injury, uh, an injury while rock climbing over 14 years ago and I felt a considerable height and did considerable damage to my lower spine at the time and um, like I was in my early 20s and I remember the, the specialist saying to me, you have to slow down in your life um, and there are certain things you should do and shouldn't do and you know if you don't adhere to that you're going to feel it when you're older but like when you're 22, 23 this is almost like a challenge to <laughs> um, so that you can prove people wrong and so um, I, I operated at 100 mile an hour plus um, since and um, life has been great but um, I'd say in the past three or four years I've, I've really felt um, the repercussions of that and um, I just just initially before this I, I, I had aggravated um, that injury in my lower back so I've been in lockdown for almost two weeks longer than the rest of the Republic of Ireland um, unfortunately but um, yeah, there, there was almost a sense of relief that I could just breathe for a while and that I, I didn't have to rush back into the activities that I love but um, that were um, affecting my health in a way and um, that's something that I really need to consider long term I suppose so um, yeah when you have time to think it, it, it brings a lot of things to light that you maybe should have dealt with beforehand and um, yeah have the space to consider in a wee bit more depth. Um, so after that I think um, I would be introspective by nature anyway um, and so I kind of sat back to figure out the space that we find ourselves within. Nobody knew how long restrictions would last or, or how, um, how heavy they might impede on, on our general sense of life. And so I, I stopped watching the news actually, um, I avoided the internet at all costs and I, I just tried to to relax into the space that I live in in Ackill and appreciate it more than anything. Um, life can be really busy sometimes and we, we don't let ourselves sit into where we are or where we belong and and we miss so much of life by, by that practice. 
and so for the first time in so many years I felt I was gifted just this opportunity to breathe and not have to rush around anymore balancing life in that way um, although I love it, it, it is exhausting well, um, I didn't really feel like creating art to be honest um, I, I suppose worry and confusion can, can do that and um, it would probably be more dramatic if I sat here and said that that it was business as usual um, because I guess you, you feel your sense of humanity um, and your vulnerabilities when there's so much uncertainty around you and that's actually a really important part of being just just a person, a human being a, as well as being an artist and I think you can use those emotions to your benefit um, if you channel through them uh, and my way of doing that is actually writing um, like I'm a, a great journaler at the best of times and uh, yeah, I, I think for the first five, six, maybe seven weeks of this, um, I filled my days by writing letters to people I missed, people I, I was worried about, how they were dealing with things, people I, I just love. Um, and, and in that space you're trying to find new ways to, to be a daughter and to be a friend and to be a sister and an aunt and a godmother and girlfriend and beyond. and. Um, it's extremely challenging territory, um, especially for somebody who's so um, person oriented. Like I, I just adore the people in my life, and um, yeah, they mean an awful lot to me, and they bring an awful lot to me as a person and to my work actually. And um, I really felt that presence of absence, I suppose you would call it. And from there, it, it went into a period where um, I experienced death um, within the pandemic. So a very close neighbour of mine and a very dear friend here in Ackle passed away and her family mean so much to me and um, I felt so far away from them because I couldn't do anything to help them. I, I, um, yeah, just that physical distance um, impacted really heavily on me to be honest. Um, and about a week and a half after that my aunt at home passed away and um, yeah, th then I was in isolation I suppose you could call it because I I didn't have that solidarity of the family around me um, and more than anything I felt like I, I was useless to them um, and yeah, that was a really trying time um, during this and um, I really had to dig deep in order to, to motiv motivate myself um, beyond that. Um, my body just shut down for about a week to be honest um, because you're, you're not sure what to do for the people that you love. That's just it. It's, it's not about you, it's about not being able to help others and um, yeah that affected me a lot to be honest. But um, there's no point pushing that away. I think as a person and as an artist you, you need to accept all emotions and everything that comes your way in life and channel it in a way that works for you and um, and so I considered the concept of, of balancing grief and gratitude and that kind of pulled me out of out of this um, like the slacks um, so I, I thought like how much grief can one person hold in this hand and how much gratitude can that allow me to give with the other hand and to let these forces like stretch you as much as they can um, actually seemed to be a gift um, when I thought about it. Like if we only sit with, with grief then we end up turning towards cynicism or ultimately despair. Um, and if we only know gratitude in our life then that's something of a hollow thing, isn't it? Um, it, it doesn't allow you the, the depth possible to, to know compassion and, and to understand other people's suffering and so if you can accept both and if you can realise that these are facets in all people's lives perhaps in different ratios, in different measures, at different times um, but they exist for us all and if we can just hold them and try to balance them and learn to draw from them when we need to as and when suits our nature. Um, I think that can be um, a really important step in, in not just um, striving as a person but in, but in creating art that can 
they can relate to real life and um, that has been an extremely important learning phase um, in how I can create art over this pandemic period. At the start of the new year I decided that I would build a website um, with regards to my art and, and to use that as a, a means of promotion and as a selling tool um, for the new year ahead. Um, and I didn't actually get round to that until this started. I thought it would be a good time to, to be productive on those terms and so I put together something very simple that, that I had fun doing just and that, um, that I thought was an honest representation of me. Um, I think the, the internet can be dangerous territory um, to delve into, especially with visual art. Um, like it, it's a visual world and um, I, I think um, it, it leads uh, the visual artist down this path of, of um, showcasing uh, a life or um, a personality, it, you know, behind the work as a, you know, the, all this shiny and everything that glitters and that's not the reality of, of where art really comes from, for me anyway, I'm not sure about everybody else, but um, like I, I live a really simple, ordinary life um, that I don't particularly want to, to try and make glitzy or, or glamorous because it's not and that's not who I am nor who I want to be. But um, so it, it's it's difficult to, to navigate um, how to represent yourself really genuinely online um, while still attracting um, clientele and, and you know and competing actually with those shinier lives that that seem to, to lure people in um, in one way or another and that's almost um, fodder for for aesthetics uh, in my consideration um, so yeah my website's pretty plain and simple and there's still a lot of work to do on it um, but I'll, I'll get there eventually I just I'm not a, a lover of um, all things technological <laughs> so it's going to take a wee bit more time on my terms to do that um, but I, I'd prefer to, to to make that a longer journey and to, to make it one that's completely my own rather than play to the gallery as they say which is the worst thing that we could do as people or as artists really isn't it? Um, in terms of other art projects, um, because I, I wasn't in France this year, um, there wasn't that pressure so I was able to take on other private commissions so I've still been working on some board work, um, so customization of surfboards. It's a nice uh, area of work because I love the sea so much myself and I know how important your board can be to you and um, all the joy that it helps to bring in, in terms of what we experience out in the water um, it becomes an extension of yourself in many ways and it, it travels many miles and, and sees so much beauty um, along with you so yeah that's work that I really love doing. And with that I've had um, a lot of other commissions, um, some environmentally based um, one or two people have contacted me with uh, propositions of um, illustration work for children's books, which I'm considering at the minute. Um, I'm working with a school up in Derry um, to create some illustrations for their marketing program, which is lovely. And um, also, I have a, a long-term project on the back burner that is that is slowly getting there actually. Um, and it's a dance related project. Um, it initially stemmed from a body of academic work that I, I put together while studying on the Bachelor of Arts in Outdoor Education at GMIT and um, I became extremely interested in the fusion between pedagogy of place um, and strands within outdoor education that could also um, relate to um, traditional step and percussive and Shano stance and um, I, I think the marriage of all of those concepts just um, just set me off in a whirlwind of ideas and uh, yeah I, I ended up uh, interviewing as part of my research uh, a stream of dancers from see Donegal all the way down to Kerry and um, yeah from the, those interviews I, I began painting a body of work so when you consider a dancer um, being represented in art, most usually it's um, when they're their most dynamic selves, when they're on display, 
per se. Um, when their buoyancy and vivaciousness is, is captured mid-flow as they perform and I, I was really interested in um, and the other side of that um, like not just the flamboyancy of dance but the roots of it and um, I began almost like this process of excavation so um, how those individuals related to the cultural landscape and their cultural heritage their families, their communities, um, a sense of geography around them, um, uh, their ecological awareness, just like the tradition of dance that they're involved in and uh, its origins, all these things combined just um, it really lent towards a, a grander tapestry of, of the beauty of, um, of movement and how it's created and the feelings that it imbues and the people that it represents actually um, and the stories that it tells um, not just in terms of the narrative of of display but of the people who perform that and um, yeah it's been an extremely inspiring journey actually to work on this project also humbling again and uh, just to meet people who are so connected um, to a sense of place and person and um, Unbelievable actually. I think my deadline for that that I gave myself with it was this autumn. So yeah, I, I'm really working towards that and um, finding a better stride with that now at the moment. Um, but just in terms of, of how your development of idea progresses as an artist, like especially in these conditions, I think it's, it's extremely interesting to, to consider the concept of dance in the grander terms and, and marry that with visual um, literacy or visual communication. I mean, in the situation that we all find ourselves amidst, we are literally re-choreographing life. Proprioception and sensory awareness um, begins to translate uh, as matters of our substances of, of control and safety, as of how a visual artist can, can fit into this um, formula, like our, our go-to uh, um, role is as an observer and our secondary role is as someone who can record and another role of ours is that we can draw attention to something and we can highlight it and so if you combine all of these forces together along with the re-choreograph that's an extremely extremely potent um, mixture or, or potion that that can be um, used to a greater good in society and i think especially in educational terms Exploration of dance and visual art as this combination can can only aid our, our, our cultural ecosystem. Both dance and visual art for too long um, have been seen more so as light entertainment than high value art. Well, when you join them in this manner, what could be more high value than the realisation that they can help people survive? Do you know what? I think that's an extremely important topic to, to breach actually. Um, the consideration of how art can be used is a very um, strong and empowering tool of force at a time when it's most needed um, and how this can elevate its status in a way um, at a time that it is also most needed. That's a really great question actually. God, um, I could be here all day yarning about that creativity. Um, probably anybody who's watching this who, who would like to to have a stronger um, sense of creativity in their lives should probably stop listening right now. <laughs> or at the very least take anything that I or or anyone else in fact um, says on the topic with, with a pinch or a bucket of salt. Um, I think that creativity is something that is inherent within each of us, but I believe that it is also something extremely personal that we have the responsibility to explore for ourselves. Um, when you consider creativity, it is a means of, of making something that is considered worthwhile. Um, and that really opens the floodgates, doesn't it? Because how do we consider something worthwhile when we're all different and have different uh, ideas about life and um, yeah. What we value comes from our perceptions and what our 
perceptions probably derive from our, our experiences in life. Um, so um, it takes horses for courses and there's different strokes for different folks as they say and that's really important to remember I think. Um, creativity just doesn't wash the page with, with one single brush stroke. Um, creativity is something, it's almost an attitude I think that um, that has to be explored and, and stepped into and, um, and sought after perhaps by the individual. Um, it's like having a, a tank of oil out the side of the house but um, like you only really turn on the heating whenever you need it, isn't that right? Like, uh, when you're cold, maybe creativity is a wee bit like that, like you only, you only go to it whenever you feel a need to and um, that make, brings me to the point that for me as an individual creativity feels like a need, it really does. Um, and it, it's something that you can't get rid of. Um, it's like this requirement for expression that like drives you to do things that you otherwise really wouldn't do. Like <laughs> just like look at my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um when when you go back to the roots of what the word might mean or where it might come from, and I don't know the etymology of it, but um I imagine that creativity back in the day must have been just a means of survival. Um, like when people's backs were really against the wall when there was challenge and adversity and, and difficulty. Like ingenuity and imagination can get you out of a lot of different fixes to be honest. Um, and that's a need. And so I would say that there is no harm in going back to that sense of creativity in, in those really humble terms that um, that when we're, we find ourselves challenged or when we face difficulty or um, when life is tough because it really can be and um, that's for sure. I think that the best thing to do is, is lean into that, not run away from it um, because that, that then inspires that, that need to respond, not react but respond in a manner that, that helps you pull through and it, it is as great a way as you can, in, in as formidable a way as you can, and in a way that nobody but you can, if that makes sense. Um, I think creativity in contemporary terms has like many words or concepts uh, in contemporary society evolved with the, the fabric or the nature of society, um, words like adventure, um, and, and they all kind of become soft in a way so um, maybe creativity has been overused uh, to the point where it becomes, um, I don't know, um, maybe a pursuit of pleasure um, more than anything and, and there's no harm in that, like um, single words can mean many things at the best of times but um, I just think the important thing is not to forget that it can be many things and not just this pleasurable pursuit because to dip your toe into the world of art or, or creativity in its greatest sense um, is to know that that is an extremely challenging world, that, it, that it's not going to be gifted to you on a platter <laughs> um, and that it will ask things of you that you've never expected, you hadn't even dreamed of before and the only way that creativity is going to work for you, I would say, is if you develop an attitude that embraces that and that is open to that and that almost welcomes that. Just, um, I suppose going back to like the very first points in my interview um, that um, you really need to know what you value and um, you, you need to find a space. I'd say that's what it is. Do you know whenever you're small and you're, you're learning to play football or probably any sport actually, any team sport and you're told to be aware of the space and to find the space well, I would say the same in the world of art. I would say know your values and, and in accordance with those, find the space within which um, art can make sense for you um, and you can then employ a sense of creativity. Um, like a, a sense of social justice is very important in my work. Um, I think that it, it helps me feel part of a grander context that I really care about. Um, the world isn't perfect and um, nor am I but uh, maybe by 
by thinking about things and, and shining a light on certain topics, then, then you can change things in a positive way on occasion, not always. Or you can shift attitude around these things and um, we all have a responsibility to try our bit, don't we? But um, that's just what works for me on, on one level. Yeah, don't, don't let being a baker become more important than making a good loaf. I would say that as well. I can't think of any other way to express that. Sometimes people like the idea of being creative and being an artist more than the reality of it. Um, and I suppose all of our egos can, can uh, come into play at times. But um, some of the most creative people I know have never sat down to draw or to compose a tune or to create a painting. Um, they just, by their whole attitude to life, are, are naturally inspiring in, in just their approach and, and their spirit. Um, and I would really say that my parents are an exemplary form of that. Um, yeah, just the more you get to know yourself a wee bit better. Um, and once you feel happier with, with who that person is, with who you are, then y you won't be able to, to not create because there's a real sense of acceptance and joy in that um, that makes you want to share you with the world as well as everything else. It's, I think a sense of humour is really important to creativity. Um, I'm going back to the playfulness again that I mentioned earlier as well. I, I have a story. So um, the wee lamb is distracting me, sorry. Um, an Ackle Harp Festival last October. I should really give it a plug. Yes, Ackle Harp Festival, look it up on the website. There's still things going ahead for this autumn, I think. So yeah, check that out. Fantastic gang of people. But um, yeah, I met um, Brendan uh, Begley at it last year and we got into a discussion about his Camino voyage, obviously. And um, knowing that, that, um, that I really love being on the sea um, and at sea, we got into this grand old conversation about voyages and up and coming voyages. Um, I had hoped to, to sail to the Outer Hebrides this summer, which obviously won't go ahead now, and which I'm really gutted about, um, and that was part of the crew from, from Waterford on the Flying Fulmer. But yeah, um, anyway, I was telling Brandon about this, and I said, you know, if, if a seat ever comes up, or a slat of wood ever comes up on uh, one of your voyages on the Vogue, w would you consider me as, as being someone that, that could take part in that? And um, he looked me up and down, and I'm sure he was thinking, your own couldn't even lift the oar of an evoke, never mind row it a hundred miles across the sea. But um, after we went, he laughed, and he said, um, ah, sure, every crew needs a classy. And uh, I laughed, and he laughed, and this went on for a while. And she sure wasn't I really delighted with myself, because, you know, back home in Tyrone, when you say something is classy, or someone is classy, you mean that they're deadly, like the you couldn't get better than him and I was pretty sure that this meant I had secured my seat on his next voyage but um, in regaling the story to another friend he said are oh, you begging you to Pauline like do you not know that Asquilga classy means like a joke or a trickster um, sorry this wee lab is so distracting uh, a trickster someone who's always joking um, and to be honest at the time I was mortified when I realised this um, but in hindsight, Brendan was right. Um, every crew does need a classy because um, when people are finding things tough, you know, humour can play a massive role and it's a great gift to have in life. Um, and as an artist, when you have to carry yourself through all these different processes and journeys and the ability to finance life and to promote your work and promote yourself when it's the last thing you want to do, and then a pandemic hits and, you know, it, it just gets harder and harder sometimes. Then um, you really need that, that classiness or that sense of humour. And um, I think that, that also shows in your work. We can treat very serious topics with humour at times and, and that's a way of, of helping others to understand them or to get through them. Um, or, or to make them better again, but um, yeah, that's how I'm going to finish this off, by saying that my most um, wonderful advice to anybody who wants to feel or be more creative in life is to, in the words of the great Ron Burgundy, 
and with the spirit of the mighty Brendan Begley. Just stay classy. <laughs>